Hello everyone, I'm Jane Boyru, the producer of Yorkshire Sculpture International. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the first of our International Artist Talks for 2020, which is taking place here in the digital space given the current circumstances. We had planned for Alexandra to be with us in Yorkshire at this time to give this talk. However, we hope that she will visit us when it is safe to do so. Yorkshire Sculpture International is a partnership between the Henry Moore Institute, Leeds Art Gallery, the Hepworth Wakefield and Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And we held our first sculpture festival in summer last year, which featured new commissions, debut presentations, major exhibitions in the galleries and sculpture outdoors in Leeds and Wakefield, with a programme of events over the 100 days. Talks by international artists and artists from across the UK and are an important part of Yorkshire Sculpture International, with engagement right at the heart of the programme. We're really thrilled to feature Alexandra Peric from Romania to begin our 2020 Talks programme. We also wanted to thank Arts Council England for their support. Alexandra is an internationally renowned artist with a background in dance and choreography. She fuses performance, dance, sculpture, spoken word and music in her work. She works in different spaces, including museums, theatrical frameworks and outdoors in the public realm to create choreographed actions, performative moments and performative environments. I first saw her work at Sculpture Project Munster in 2017. Entitled Leaking Territories, it affected me deeply. This work powerfully transformed the historical city hall in Munster into a public space of active reflection as a performance dynamically and collaboratively and so movingly reconstructed key moments in history and then together embodied a live search engine interacting with us, the audience. Alexandra's works deal with monumentality or the history of a specific place and institutions in order to playfully tackle and transform existing hierarchies. Her installations explore history and the invisible structures of power, reflecting on the history and function of gestures in art and popular culture, or on questions about the body, its presence, absence or image, and the politics of capture. In 2013, Alexandra represented Romania with Manuel Palmas at the Venice Biennale. And she's exhibited internationally, including Manifesto 10 in St. Petersburg in 2014, Berlin Biennale in 2016, Sculpture Project Munster, and the High Line in New York, both in 2017, and Art Basel in the Messeplatz last year. She's also presented performative environments across the world, including the Pompidou in Paris, the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw, Tate Modern, and the New Museum in New York. Alexandra's performative works are part of public and private collections as live actions. I'm now going to hand over to Alexandra, who is connected with us from her home in Bucharest and will present her talk, Sculpture Alive, Materiality and Mutability of Form, Structure and Meaning, which will then be followed by questions from the audience presented by my colleagues, Mega Goodeve and Lily Lavarato. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Hello, hi, uh, I hope you can all see me. Thank you very much, Jane, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to be part of this context and to open this series of talks. Um, uh, basically, I'm gonna try to, uh, let's say, think out loud about sculpture uh, using um, some examples of my works to do that and to also, uh, go through some of the points that I laid out in the abstract. Um, I'm going to start by sharing the screen. Um, so I, I wanted to start with a, the, a small part of the title and with the sculpture alive. Uh, I think usually performative works that are also um, framed as sculpture and that are sculpture and can be seen as sculpture um, tend to be described as living sculpture. So whenever you have live human bodies and performers becoming sculpture, um, uh, I guess this is the, the most common term, living sculpture. And I've always, I've had some sort of discomfort about it or um, somehow something didn't really, 
sound right. I think um, um, I prefer to think of other materials that enable sculptural forms uh, as also being um, or having a life of their own, even though, um, of course, they might not all be technically alive. But somehow I think it's interesting to think that other materials um, are also, uh, you know, they, they continue somehow to be active and they're subject to change and they they do change and, and they have also, they continue to have agency over the forms in which they're shaped. And I think it's, it's more interesting to, to look at, at how specific qualities of certain materials are used and for what goals. And in, in that sense, I guess also, um, sculptures in other materials can be understood as being alive. And, uh, I think it also opens up a new way of looking at these objects so when it comes to museums and preservation and conservation and uh, sometimes com um, conflicts with the, the very purposes of sculptures that, for example, are meant to be touched or manipulated, but this idea that they need to be kept in an a uh, fixed form prevents them from uh, from being used and experienced as they are meant to. So I, I was more interested in this uh, in this idea of sculpture being alive or also being alive, uh, rather than making a difference between uh, sculpture and living sculpture. Um, and um, I want to start with uh, a series of works. Almost um, uh, the first work that uh, I made and I, that could be better framed as sculpture. There's a previous work in the same vein, but I don't have a good image of it. So I'm gonna start with this one. Um, this is part of a series of interventions on and sculptural additions to public monuments um, that I made in 2011 um, in Bucharest, so in my home city. Um, as Jane mentioned, I am, this is maybe important to say, I'm trained in classical dance and contemporary dance earlier on. Um, and then I've worked with more, let's say, conceptual forms of dance and with the field of choreography, but I've always imagined it as being a very expanded field. So somehow crossing uh, very clear borders and boundaries between disciplines uh, seemed natural um, at some point. And I, I keep trying to work, uh, let's say, um, in an undisciplined manner and not, not really taking into account uh, this fiction of very well delimited territories and, and borders between fields of knowledge. Um, but this is, I get, and I've made works also for, for the stage before this work, for example, um, more theatrical or works that could be better understood or more traditionally understood as dance, but also installations. And this is one of the first works in the public space, which I think can be better understood as culture and, and seen as culture. Um, because of the, the quality and, and dynamics of motion, so there's quite minimal movement in it. There's never stillness, but nevertheless, it's quite minimal in movement. Uh, it tries to work with the temporality of sculpture, let's say. So we are adding as you can see, there's a group of bodies of people uh, adding to, to the monument. Um, and we were adding our bodies, I'm also part of the group um, here, um, to the sculptures, to this public monument for a couple of hours every day for, uh, this was going on for two weeks every day. So there was, um, we wanted to work, I was interested in working with this uh, persistent, uh, persistence and a temporality of a sculpture, not of an, not of an event, let's say. Um, and I, I will go back to, to the question of temporality and persistence, but uh, again, I think this is what also makes the work somehow more of a sculpture, let's say. Um, and also, I think, again, it's sculptural because the, it's one of the first works where there is a very explicit interest in materials and in, 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 in an encounter between materialities and in what sort of tension arises from from this encounter. So I, I was very much interested, for example, in, play, um, in placing human bodies um, and the life presence and the human scale in relation to you know, this apparent immutability of uh, bronze or stone um, and this oversized representations of, uh, of the human subject and also of particular historical narratives that particular materials were meant to, let's say, um, fix um, fixate and, and ossify. Um, so somehow 
I think it's interesting again to notice how how the content or like how the historical narrative that is supposed to be embodied by particular monuments is um, is somehow enabled by the use of particular materials. Um, um, and for me, this was of course also a way of claiming some sort of agency over something public, but that nevertheless is meant not to be questioned really. So it's placed at a distance that you cannot really engage with it. Um, it's supposed to tower over you, so you, you're supposed to feel overwhelmed because of the scale by, by this monument. And um, I was very much interested in, in questioning also what a public monument and what public memory should be about. Um, I'm not going to try to interpret the work too much. I, I was basically interested in replicating the posture of the horse in this um, around this equestrian statue. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's, but I think it's important to say that uh, the work can be interpreted locally, so it has a particular significance, I think, in the local context. Um, for example, this particular equestrian, it's a representation of Karol I, a Romanian monarch. Um, and it's actually a reproduction of an older sculpture, an older equestrian of Karol I, that was taken down by the communist regime uh, and, and uh, melted so the material was transformed into a statue of Lenin, which was then also uh, taken down um, and, and um, it disappeared uh, uh, after the Romanian revolution of 1989, so after the fall of the communist bloc, Eastern bloc. Um, I'm sorry. And somehow, um, um, yes, and this uh, ongoing uh, repurposing of materials is also interesting, and, and it's also interesting how, for example, after the after the revolution, when uh, um, th there was, let's say, a kind of a almost ideological void or a void of, of of an imaginary of an image of the future, somehow the Romanian authorities felt like this opening or this space left empty. Uh, it's a bad thing and, and uh, they felt the need to occupy it with something and uh, what they occupied it with was uh, an image of the past somehow reproduced in the present and to uh, yeah to to continue in the future so uh, it's yeah this all became quite interesting to me and I think it's interesting to look at the work uh, from a situated local perspective uh, while at the while at the same while at the same time at the same time or uh, taking or entering into a dialogue and our tension with the very format of the equestrian uh, sculpture as a public monument because they are of course uh, um, they are used internationally and they are you know they're, they they are very clear and obvious projections projections of a particular type of power and they associate strength and and power and uh, authority you know always with the very same character. So you always have a man, um, this uh, individual hero, which is a male hero, on top of a horse, so dominating an animal and dominating its subject. And it's a lot about uh, like performing this sort of uh, authoritarian, patriarchal idea of conquest um, and, and power through this sort of uh, presence. Uh, so I think in a way, uh, I was always interested in works that can be read and interpreted locally, but that could be relatable from other perspectives and other points of view. Um, and I want to move to another work, uh, which is called Persistent Feebleness. Uh, it's a series of sculptural additions to the four German virtues. You can only see three of these four German virtues um, in the image. Uh, there are four of them, and there are four sculptural additions. Uh, at the monument uh, to the Battle of the Nations in Leipzig, it's a rather huge monument that is meant to, let's say, um, commemorate the birth of the German nation. Um, it commemorates the Prussian army victory over Napoleon in 1812. Uh, and somehow it's, it's, it's meant to, to project this idea of a, of a German nationhood and, and uh, German people. Um, and um, as you can see, somehow these sculptures that are laid out through the interior of the monument, which is called the Hall of Fame, uh, are, are these huge uh, colossi-like stone um, constructions. And even though they are not more than 100 years old, because the monument is actually 
well, a little bit more than 100 years old. The monument is erected uh, around 1912. Uh, they, they are sculpted in this aesthetic of, uh, you know, almost like this Egyptian colossi in order to project some sort of mythical German past and, and, uh, and some sort of ancient quality. Uh, about uh, nationhood, which is actually a very, um, very modern, quite recent construction. Um, and again, I beyond, um, let's say, the narrative uh, of each uh, sculptural edition, um, I'm interested in this kind of confrontation or encounter in, in materialities, materials and scale. Uh, but of course, the, the the way in which, let's say, performers body bodies um, are able to interfere with and, and produce, produce a detournement, let's say, in, in the significance and in the meaning of the original monument is also very important. So I am interested in re-signifying uh, these uh, sculptural um, structures and these public monuments and, and in, in opening them up for interpretation and for questioning. And, and in that sense, I think it's, uh, it ha the works also have a lot to do with this idea of history as a process, it's something that is always being reinterpreted and reread and uh, reconsidered from the point of view of the present. Um, so it's never a closed uh, object, it's never a closed process uh, either. Um, but at the same time, again, I think the very, the very confrontation between scales and the frailty of the human body and the, again, the sizes uh, of, of these sculptures and their materialities is, is somehow important and it signifies on its own. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to say something about the title also because uh, I, I was also interested in this uh, question of persistence, like in the, in the previous work somehow, um, I think it's important to think that that life presence and you know the, the precarity and the frailty of the human body can still be powerful and strong and persistent. And somehow it's not about a very solid, continuous type of presence. But um, I, I think I, I was interested in something that reoccurs or can come back and return. So you never you never get rid of it somehow, and it, it keeps it keeps coming back. So in that sense. Uh, I'm also interested in, in let's say, apparently apparent contradictions like persistent feebleness. And I also want to move to um, this other work, which is called Soft Power. Um, and it's a series of sculptural additions to uh, public monuments in St. Petersburg. It was part of the public program of Manifesta 10. Um, and as you can see here, this is a monument of Catherine the Great um, in St. Petersburg. Catherine the Great and her entourage of noblemen. So the, 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 the construction is, is also somehow meant to, uh, to let's say, uh, represent a certain hierarchy. Um, and th there were some missing links in this decorative chain around the monument. So somehow it felt like <laughs> the work is, uh, is, uh, is right there. And um, in this particular uh, edition, I am, uh, performers basically um, take, uh, become this sort of least important units of the li living body becomes a, maybe you this least important unit in this particular representation of a specific order of in, um, imperial order actually uh, and it's it's also something that that uh, that happens by by performance taking turns so it's supposed to be persistent and to have to to remain in place for a couple of hours uh will with performance taking turns and in in the in within the structure for a couple of minutes and this is part of the same series, um, a sculptural addition to the Bronze Horseman, uh, which is another question sculpture, actually. It's um, a sculpture of Peter the Great. And the pedestal this time takes the, uh, took the, the shape of a, of a rock, which is called a thunderstone. Um, and uh, there's a, yeah, basically the, the work implied that the that performers would come and sunbathe on and around the monument. So perform this rather, in these rather relaxed postures around this figure of, of uh, authority. Um, 
And there's an interesting story about this, and which I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of time to, to tell, uh, because the, the monument is placed in a park at the end of a park. It's a very touristic spot also. Um, and at that time, at least in, in 2014, um, people were not really allowed to sunbathe or to lay on the grass in the park. And, and they couldn't sit on the lawn. Of course, a lot of people were sitting on the lawn. Nevertheless, um, at particular times, you know, policemen would come and they would ask people to move away from the lawn. And people would move away from the lawn. And then in a couple of minutes when the policemen would be gone, they would come back and sit on the lawn. And then again, after a while, policemen would come and ask them to move away. So this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, absurd performance uh, was going on for a while. Um, and of course, the, the, the policemen would come and check what is going on, I don't know what, what the fuck is happening near the monument and, uh, and on this, uh, this rather uh, untouchable uh, space. Um, and we had an authorization, a legal permit to be there. And this is all, also something important. Uh, all these actions happened with a legal authorization, with a legal permit. Um, and I, I have a lot of respect for, uh, you know, guerrilla-like actions and protest actions uh, that happen without the permission, without um, a permission from an authority. But at the same time, in these particular cases, I was very much interested in using the institutional channels that were available to me um, to produce uh, certain spaces of possibility and, 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 and certain actions that wouldn't otherwise be possible, you know, and to, to test how much you can, you can interfere with general regulations and especially when we're talking about public space. Um, so uh, we've always had an, um, a legal permit and I, we managed to obtain a permission to be there. And of course, so the, the police couldn't do anything about it. And at some point it's interesting because people in the park who are being constantly asked to move away from the law and realize that, uh, you know, authority for that time being has no power over the space uh, around the monument. So some of them actually at some point crossed this uh, small vegetation fence uh, that you maybe can see around the monument and they started sunbathing with the performers around and on the, the, the pedestal on the thunderstone. So what, what you actually see in the very first image on top uh, is not just performance, it's also you know, people from the park who, um, who use this opportunity <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, to be uh, in a public, uh, in an un less regulated way, let's say. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I somehow, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because maybe this is also something that art is, is good or can do in, in creating somehow a space where things that are not usually possible become possible for a little while and and I, I think this is this is somehow an interesting kind of power let's say and the other image is from a sculptural addition to the Lenin monument at Finland station and as you you can see again it, it deals all right I think it's important to think that you can deal with history uh, not by erasure or obliterating it but by by adding to it sometimes maybe a simple gesture uh, can help um, again resignify and, and bringing back into question particular historical events in this case I think again it's, it's a quite clear gesture of opening up uh, the perspective uh, and, and again adding to, to uh, the, the Lenin sculpture um, I also wanted to mention this work, which is actually called Monument to Work, and it's a public monument. Um, so in this case, there is no pre-existing uh, monument, there is no structure um, to relay to, but um, somehow the performer's bodies and human bodies become the monument, and they become the memorial, and the human scale becomes the uh, a form of of of, um, of monument, uh, let's say. Um, it's a work that basically. I, I hope it's a lot more ambiguous and subversive than the title might indicate. Um, it, it, it's a work that, that basically remembers uh, movements from the factory floor that have disappeared uh, with automation. Um, and they are, uh, they are abstracted and distorted, so they are taken out of a relationship with the machine and, and with efficiency and uh, with their original function. And they are performed a lot slower and, and they can be distorted so that they become somehow pleasurable for the body. 
And of course, they also enter another regime of production in the case of, of the artwork. And it functions also a bit like a public ritual. So um, it's also part of the collection of public art agency in Sweden, and they reinstall it um, quite often. So it again, in, it's a type of memorial that that um, exists uh, and it persists through reoccurrence, through through uh, through yeah, being reinstalled and reperformed in the public space, also in different cities uh, throughout uh, Sweden. Um, and I, I I want to move to a series of works in institutional context and in let's say in the white cube uh, that somehow follow in the same line of interest in, in downscaling or working with uh, or demonumentalizing uh, this big uh, monumental uh, structures and in this case the monumental structure is the is the institution somehow in the history of the Venice Biennial. So the work is called An Immaterial Retrospective of the Venice Biennial, Venice Biennale. It's a collaboration with another artist, Manuel Pelmuch, for the Romanian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2013. And basically um, performers, five performers, um, which are not the same because it lasted throughout the whole duration of the Biennial for six months, but it's always five performers in an empty white pavilion that enact, they embody, and of course transform uh, artworks from the whole history of the biennial from 1895 when the first edition took place to uh, that edition in 2013. Uh, and again, it's also a lot about claiming a power and, uh, to rewrite and, and, and uh, reperform history in the, again, quite fragile material of the living body but it's it's also kind of a, a power gesture let's say um especially because it is uh, taken on by the romanian pavilion and for whomever has been to venice um you know the giardini where most of the a lot of the national pavilions are being uh, um, have their own space is pretty much laid out uh, according to you know um, um the geopolitical power and how it it, it also uh, uh, manifest in the present. So in that sense, Romania is really at the very end of the Giardini. It's nevertheless in the Giardini, <laughs> but it's really, it's really in, in a corner, the very end of the, of the, of the place. And somehow it was interesting to claim this, uh, this capacity to look at the whole history of the Venice Biennial from that particular situated position. Um, and again, to, to rewrite and, and take a new look and embody to look at history uh, through, through via the performer's body. Um, and this is another work in, in, the, in a similar direction. It's called Public Collection. Um, and it also has art history as a reference, let's say. Um, it's a subjective uh, selection, a collection of artworks that, um, that are transformed by the performers. It's important to say that it was never about a translation, but about a complete, you know, an, an interpretation, a subjective interpretation of particular artworks that then, and this interpretation is actually what gets to materialize again in the performers' bodies. Um, and it's also quite sculptural work. The, the work in Venice uh, is also sculptural in, let's say, a more traditional understanding of sculpture, where, where you think of something that, that is not moving too much. But of course, there is kinetic sculpture. I mean, there are different forms of sculpture, but if you think, you know, the very first thing that you think about when you think of sculpture, you would think of something that is not it's not moving a lot. Um, so in that sense, this is also quite sculptural. There is movement, of course, and there is uh, sound and there is text, but nevertheless, the, the movement of the performers is quite minimal. And this has changed somehow also throughout my practice. And um, I'm interested in, in more, more movement and somehow sculpture that moves more also. Um, but uh, but these two works are still quite uh, quite settled, let's say. And this is an enactment of a study of perspective by Ai Weiwei and um, Bird in Space by Konstantin Gunkush, quite famous sculpture. 
And, and public collection also it was somehow flexible in its structure. So depending, again, it was uh, transportable and it could be shown in different contexts, but also uh, it could be localized and it could enter into a dialogue with the particular context in which it was being shown, such as uh, this exhibition at the Van Abbe Museum, for example, which is called Confessions of the Imperfect and actually wanted to look at modernity. Uh, and then public collection becomes public collection of modern art and the core selection, the core collection of artworks that are embodied by performers uh, expand to in, uh, expands to include some artworks that become somehow relevant for modernity. Um, also a series of manifestos, for example, and so on. And uh, also in this case, when it was shown, um, at the opening of the tanks in Tate Modern, uh, public collection becomes public collection of uh, Tate Modern and it includes, it enters into a dialogue with some works from the Tate Modern collection. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to move to, to this other work because it's also, uh, I think it's a lot about sculpture that, that starts to move more and, and, and is able to, to circulate beyond the uh, original material confinements, let's say. And this is called Parton and Marbles. Um, and basically it's a, it's a re-materializing of the Parton and Marbles um, the objects in the British Museum collection. Um, and a re-materializing in different places. So the, the, let's say it's, it's almost, it's an attempt to make, let's say, global heritage truly global and have it circulate across borders more freely. And I think some background information could be helpful here. So the Parthenon marbles are kind of famous uh, art objects. They are uh, um, a, a collection of sculptures, metops and friezes that belong to the Parthenon on the Acropolis of Athens. And they were looted in uh, the beginning of the 19th century and are part now of the British Museum collection. And they are subject of a repatriation request from, from the Greek state. They're one of the many objects actually that are um, under these controversies, you know, whether they, um, there are many objects that have been, let's say, controversially acquired and they're part of so-called universal museums uh, collections and, and their places of origin requires them back and, and requires them back in, in, in some form or another. Um, and for me, it was also interesting to take the discussion a bit beyond the question of repatriation, which I think somehow keeps um, uh, keeps uh, keeps uh, reasserting an idea of, of borders and of enclosures and and uh, and I think the work is a lot about again uh, making so-called global heritage truly global and and giving it the possibility to circulate beyond specific spatial confinements and particular financial networks or networks of interests uh, and power mm, and the very first image is from a, let's say a symbolic repatriation uh, on the Acropolis of Athens in front of the Parthenon, but then uh, they've also traveled to the Museum of Modern Art in Moscow, as you can see in the other image. Um, and there's another image now uh, from the Cadiz Gallery in Paris and from the Stock Exchange Palace in Portugal. And they've also traveled to Tokyo, <laughs> so you can see how uh, later in the year. Uh, and the work is about many things. There's also an important layer of text that is spoken by the performers that tells the story of the marbles, um, speculates about finance and derivatives and again, uh, universal collections and the concept of cultural capital and so on. Um, but I think the, the important relation to, to sculpture is that these become sculptures that can move uh, with different living bodies and they can, let's say, uh, they are enabled by uh, living bodies across borders and in different locations. Um, and to somehow continue with this, um, <laughs> this idea of sculpture that moves more, sculpture that can also be in movement. Um, this is Leaking Territories um, uh, from 2017. It's a work that um, um, Jane also mentioned in the beginning. It's very nice that, that uh, you go to see it, Jane. Um, 
and it was made for this uh, rather legendary sculpture exhibition, which is the Minister Sculpture Project, which takes place every 10 years. And somehow this is a very interesting uh, time span because uh, every decade you also get to see how the concept of sculpture has expanded or what, what, what it became and what it came to include. And in the 2017 edition, I was one of the few artists that, were in, that worked with performative practices and um, was invited to be part of this kind of um, major sculpture exhibition. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, and indeed, the, 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 the work uh, was also quite well located and it had a particular um, connection to the site. Um, it, from a sculptural point of view, again, it, I think this is where, yeah, I think the, 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 the sculpture aspect is, is very much related to movement. So sculpture is understood as something that is always becoming, always, always, uh, transforming so uh, it's about finding form and then letting go and finding other form and the performers um, um, yeah, they construct themselves into all sorts of arrangements and then deconstruct and then become something um, something else so it's, it's a lot about yeah, again sculpture and movement and it was also consistent somehow with the with the subject of the work which was the concept of territory but the concept of territory is seen as uh, also as a as a fiction as a construction that had to do with the geographical space but also with identity and nationality and and, and so on and for example the, the the google search engine that the performers embody at some point it's a lot about this construction of the territory of identity by the online by online protocols um, um, and, and so somehow it uh, it tries to imagine the sort of post-identitarian, post-national space of becoming. And in this sense, I think this quality of uh, sculpture and movement um, is consistent with, with the subject um, of the work. Um, and it's, again, it's a work that can be very well localized. It can be transported, but it always has to find a very clear connection to the, the location in which, and the context in which it is being presented. And in Münster, the Frieden Saal is actually where um, at the Treaty of Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia was signed at the end of the 17th century, I think 1684. Uh, and it's not a very well known event somehow, but it's a very important one actually. It, it marks the beginning of the end of a very complicated European uh, war. And also it, it sets the basis for uh, international law, the concept of sovereignty, for example, and the, the concept of modern nation state. Um, and this idea that uh, you know, territories uh, should be governed by being enclosed um, with borders and so on. Um, and the work that begins with a reference to the site. Um, uh, it was also um, uh, shown uh, in London last year at the Imperial War Museum. It's so quite a, a problematic space, actually. There's a wonderful team of women that are working in a very, or they try to work in an interesting way with the place and also to uh, commission and have contemporary artworks uh, interact with the display of the museum. Um, and I showed Leaking Territories with a Block Universe uh, Festival. Uh, and it, again, uh, it had to connect to the site. And so it begins with a reference to the transatlantic slave trade uh, in that particular location. But then it, it goes on again to survey different historical events. Some of them are also fictional. So this is maybe also important that not all the references that I use sometimes are actually real. And I'm interested in, in this mixture of facts and, and fiction. Um, and this is, um, uh, another work that I think can be very well seen as sculptural, though it is it is mostly presented as a performative environment, but it could also be understood as a sort of ever shifting landscape. It's a it's a very large scale work, so basically it's always around sixty something, eighty something performers uh, enveloping visitors in this sort of um, embodied time capsule. Uh, for which the reference is actually uh, NASA's golden record. So this again, subjective archive, this selection of uh, information about life on earth that was, was sent into space uh, you know, to, to be encountered and somehow to convey some information about life on earth to an alien species. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, the references are, are a lot more mixed 
of course, there are many works in between these works that then probably if I were to make an overview, some transitions are more obvious. But here, uh, you know, there are uh, art historical references, but also all sorts of references of different life forms, uh, plant life, animal life, um, um, poetry. Um, it, 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 it's, it's very mixed, actually. And also, I think it includes some, some fictional uh, aspects and some fictional events. But what I think is interesting about this work is that it does away, uh, also when you, in terms of sculpture, um, it does away with this idea that uh, as, a, as a visitor, let's say, you can have an outside perspective and you look at the work from the outside. So it's very um, anti-modern in a sense. Um, it tries to do away with the separation between the observer and the observed. And you're always, we are always part of what we try to observe actually, but somehow we try to convince ourselves that we're not. But this work I think makes it uh, very explicit. So you can never be on the outside. So somehow in this sense, culture happens around you and it surrounds you. Uh, and even when you, you know, when you try to do, a, let's say, a, 360 to turn three 360 degrees by the time you you're back to where you started somehow um something changed so you never you never you can never see the whole work and you you always have the the partial perspective and i think it's, it's interesting to think about sculpture also as an environment not as an, an object that you can uh, that you can see from the outside and it was um, so this is um these are two images from our very first installation uh, at the Neue Berliner Kunstverein in Berlin, and then from, uh, from Buenos Aires, from uh, the Hopscotch Rayuel exhibition within Arbaza cities in 2018, indoors. And in Buenos Aires, we also tried an outdoor version um, in the public space. Um, and this was also most recent installation in with our Basel at the Mesa Platz last year in this especially built pavilion um, that was designed by Andre Dino. It's quite a beautiful structure, it has something like science fiction. It looks a bit like this uh, electric jellyfish, but it was also inspired by medical isolation spaces. And it somehow was interesting to think about it now. Also because there was you know, such a large presence inside and, um, and a very important part of the work, a very important rule in the work, which is quite loose structurally, so there is no clear narrative, but there are some rules that are to be negotiated by performers. One of them is that you are supposed to, to pick up what other people propose. Uh, so you're supposed to let yourself somehow contaminated by other forms and, 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 and actions. And it's a lot about... Uh, virality and, and contagion, but also as a, as a good thing and something that constructs our common imaginary and, 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 and forms, uh, let's say. And I, I, I also want to quickly mention these two other works because this is also where the, let's say, presence or the um, performers become sculptural in a different way. Uh, both these works, it's, this is Conatural for the New Museum in New York City, and this is Human Landscape um, for uh, Public Art Ruhr last year. They feature live performers, but also a so-called hologram performer. And I'm, 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 I'm bracketing somehow, I'm well, doing this <laughs> with hologram, because technically the, 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 this sort of ethereal ghostly image that you see it's not really a hologram, it's, it's, it's how it is being described in popular culture, where uh, maybe you've heard about, or you've seen, or you've heard about these celebrities um, being resurrected in this form, like Tupac or Michael Jackson, or also Maya Callas, I think recently, um, in the form of these, let's say, holograms that all of a sudden start performing again. And they're actually Pepper's Ghost projection, uh, projections there. It's, it's a 19th century um, te technology, uh, but of course it can be better uh, realized now. Uh, but somehow, so the, the works featured the live performers that uh, work together and produce meaning together with its uh, ghostly presences that are nevertheless enabled by this very big heavy objects, which uh, it's one object actually, which is this glass pyramid 
with uh, some screens on top of it, which enables this projection and the illusion of this ethereal, this digital presence uh, inside it. Um, so again, in both works feature a very um, obvious cultural element in, in the shape of this object that uh, enables this, uh, yeah, this ghostly, uh, immaterial, though very material presence, let's say. Uh, again, I don't want to, I can't really talk uh, about the works and that they're quite complicated and complex, but uh, and I think there, there, there is quite um, some information about them to be found if it's interesting. Um, but I think it's important to, yeah, to also mark this uh, different cultural aspect when it comes to, to both co-natural and human landscape. Um, and I actually want to come close to, to the end with this work, which is, a, again, it's a public space work. Uh, it's called Tilted Arc, and it's basically a reconstruction of a, of a Serra work, a Richard Serra work, Tilted Arc, uh, which was, uh, you know, this large steel arc cutting across a square in New York City. Um, and it, it's... It, it's one of the examples of, let's say, failed public art projects because it, it created um, a lot of controversy and somehow, you know, a lot of people complained about it and in the end it was removed from, from its position. It sits in storage somewhere, so it was never installed somewhere else. Um, and uh, I was wondering, you know, what, what, and I'm interested, of course, in Sarah's work because it has this choreographic aspect to it. So it, it creates a certain choreography um, uh, of visitors. And when you, when you encounter it, it forces you to move in particular ways. And I, now, so I'm interested in, in these gestures. At the same time, I was wondering what happens with the gesture if you produce it with a different materiality and how can this uh, rather, let's say, authoritarian gesture in, or a gesture that becomes authoritarian when you perform it in a certain material in a certain way, and of course in a particular space, how does it transform when, when you think about it with a different materiality and in a different kind of, uh, with a different kind of quality of presence. Um, so I proposed uh, a reconstruction of this tilted arc, of this arc cutting across the square uh, with performers for the 12th Swiss sculpture exhibition, uh, which was called Le Mouvement, actually, in Bilbien in Switzerland. Um, and uh, here is also where I want to tie into the, you know, the work of Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore and what I found so interesting also always in, in, in these pierced forms and in these hollow spaces in their works. I think, uh, I think there's something very sophisticated also in terms of power and, um, uh, and, and, and artistic quality when you allow interruptions and when you allow uh, empty space, because it, it's also, it's never an absence. It's just, just something else that 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 can can move through that empty space or something else that emerges through these openings and and so i was always uh, somehow interested in this uh, you know and this uh, in this cultural gesture material cultural gesture that nevertheless allows for interruptions and 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 openings for something else to become visible through these openings. In a way, it's also an acknowledgement that the sculpture or your gesture also is never really yours and always collaborates with the outside or it's always co-constituted uh, by something outside. Uh, and, and I think uh, I was somehow interested in similar things when, when, uh, when I proposed and I made this work and I, I want to um, yeah, I want to show a short documentation just because I think that the, the dynamic and the way the work functions uh, is, is um, it's well captured by this short video It's one of the few times when I'm actually keen to show some documentation of works so I'm going to try to play the video I'll stop the screen sharing for a while and then come back to it Second. <laughs> 
screen. I hope this is now visible. It might not work great, but let's see, because of the transmission rate and on Zoom, but it's a, hopefully it, it works.
Thank you so much, Alexandra. Oh, yes, I, think, yeah, I think this would be it. I hope it, yeah, I hope I didn't cross uh, uh, the time, uh, the time slot too much. But I, yeah, this would be it. Thank you. Megan, do you want to go with the questions? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Um, sorry. Um, so, yes, as, as Jane mentioned in the introduction, we've collated um, some questions from the audience that um, we're going to ask Alexandra. Um, and some of them pick up on things that you discussed during your talk. And the first question is a question around history. And I, and I think you already started to talk, um, I really liked what you were saying about history, of seeing history as an open process, something that's not fixed and it's always um, shifting, but the kind of importance of not erasing it. Um, but Diana would like to know, particularly about um, working with monuments in the public space um, and what your approach to, to history is um, is it one that tries to maintain it in constant re-evaluation um, and one that kind of counters its uh, yeah the kind of rigidity of history yes <laughs> yes it is I mean my approach I think to, to the works that I make uh, is a lot about that keeping again history um, negotiable let's say or or as an open process um, um, and I think it, it it's also about countering uh, specific historical narratives you know history has been also mostly written by victors in many circumstances so it's always important to question uh, from what position certain historical narratives have been imposed as as being in you know true um, and uh, I think it's an important work and I think it's also you know I think a lot of people maybe think of history as something that is really very far back and it you know it shouldn't concern us so much anymore but actually it leaks into so much of the present and the future and and I think not dealing properly with history is something that keeps haunting you you know and, and again yeah I don't think it's a question of erasure it's also you don't have that kind of agency or I don't think it's um, maybe it's also not desirable. There are different situations though. So maybe, you know, when we speak about Confederate monuments in the United States, removing them from these positions on top of pedestals, maybe, you know, maybe that, that, that couldn't really count as a form of Eurasia, but it, maybe they could be recontextualized and so on. Um, so I think it's always also about minding the context, but in general, I think it's interesting to, to open up the discussion and deal with what has already happened in, in different ways and by different people from different positions also, uh, rather than, you know, trying to, to put it aside. So yes, it, um, I agree, I think, uh, yeah, it's important that history remains open and questionable. Great. Um, and my second question is from Karina, and she um, wanted to know more about your thoughts around ritual in your works. And she and she said, in in particular, monument to work, which I know that you showed us um, some images of that work and explained a bit. So. Um, yeah, it'd be great to know um, how you approach using this kind of concept of ritual in your work. I mean, I, I think it ties into the concept of memorial also and how you can exercise memory and how you can think about public and or making memory a public process also. And again, it has something to do with history and how you you settle or you, you, you think about history as something fixed or how you can open it up and 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 think about public memory as something that that can be uh, reperformed and questioned again. And and um, with monument to work, I think it was also imagined as a public ritual because from uh, from when it was commissioned actually, and it was meant to be acquired by the public art agency. And we thought together with the curator Lisa Rosendahl about the importance of it being reperformed, so reoccurring. And in that sense, you know, the, the the concept of ritual fitted quite well. It was also about remembering some. Thing. So also all this heavy labor, not reperforming it, not romanticizing it either, uh, but but acknowledging this this kind of um, 
very problematic form of labor for the body. And I've done works that have dealt with the standardization of movement and automation and how the body has been shaped into specific movements and patterns for industrial production. And it's still being standardized in many different ways uh, uh, in the current moment. Um, and it, it was a, yeah, it, it was supposed to function like a monument ritual. So something that remembers and, and, and is able, able to commemorate via a public action so with people gathering uh, in the public space, uh, this sort of uh, industrial past and also maybe thinking how it leaks into the present and how it will leak into the future. Um, and it's important because sometimes also it can be joined by people from the outside also. There's also different groups of performers uh, enacting it in different cities. So it's, it's a little bit open, let's say. Um, like many other works, like Till to Dark also could be joined by outside pe people from the outside who just want to become part of, of the structure. Um, so yeah, yes, but I, I also think this principle of, of reoccurrence and persisting through coming back and happening again is important in relation to the ritual aspect of certain works. Mm -hmm. It's nothing sacred or religious in that sense. It's just a, something of, that is public. It's a form of coming together and remembering something and practicing also something together. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I've got another couple of questions as well. Um, so the first one is from Steve and they just wanted to know a bit more about how you feel the landscape in which a sculpture sits is intrinsic, intrinsic to its personal narrative or if you think that we create narratives for objects regardless of this. I don't think, I mean, uh, the white cube, right, it was specifically invented to remove an object from its natural surroundings. And it's very much a modern uh, project in that sense of separating, you know, the nature from culture and, and, and presenting something as being separated from its environment. At the same time, I think the white cube also performs together with the object. So it performs maybe a certain sense of, uh, um, uh, let's say of abstraction of uh, um, oh my god I'm, I'm missing the word um, uh, when something is excessively clean you know and 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 and, and safe let's say uh, like uh, this surgical space also almost so it's always the the surroundings are always part of how we perceive something whether we like them to be or not. And I think it's more interesting when you work with an acknowledgement that they are part of, our, of, uh, um, of what we perceive. And in that sense, I think also with some of my works, I was interested in, again, in, in also with aggregate, for example, in, in messing up a little bit with this assumption of the white cube, you know, that it's a space that is empty in which the objects pop up in this sort of a perfect arrangement. There's enough space between them and then the audience moves around them uh, however they liked. There's also this kind of um, rehearsal of, individu of, of individuality that comes with a, a white cube actually and the, the museum space. And I was interested in, 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 in playing with that a little bit. So uh, I think somehow the, yeah, the surroundings are always part of the work. Um, and it's also why I'm quite interested in works in, in, in open spaces or in spaces that have not been designated as art spaces all the time. I'm, I'm interested in working in different, and, in, in, yeah, in different contexts and taking into account these different contexts. Uh, but I think, yeah, there are contexts where you can even, you know, you can make maybe even more meaningful work when you acknowledge uh, the, yeah, the reality and the fact that an object is always part of its background. It's gestalt and separation. Thank you so much, um, Alexandra. Um, on behalf of all of us, um, it's been a real privilege to be able to connect with you um, in this virtual way and for putting together your really thorough, fascinating talk. Um, you know, really from going back to 2011, drawing out the concept of living sculpture and sculpture that can move. And I'm also particularly interested in how you created the space for people to take, um, really to be able to uh, do things that I thought, thought weren't possible by the sculptures that you've created. Um, so it's very inspiring. And also how you work locally with people. You have an international platform, but you work with all of these local performers across the world. Um, it's really inspiring. And um, yeah, thank you. It's, uh, we've really enjoyed it. And I guess from- Thank you also. Thanks a lot for having me, Anya. I'm glad to have been part of this.
Thank, yeah, thank you, you Megan and Lily for, um, for enabling this to happen as well and um, for all your work and Lily for all the tech, which we hope um, <laughs> is working for us. So thank you. And I just wanted to thank the audience for um, bearing with us in this way and um, watching it hopefully comfortably at home and um, just keep an eye on our social media for when we announce our future program of international artist talks. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>